Yesterday, as we marked eight months since our first deaths from COVID-19, we lost another Vermonter, bringing the total to 62. After months without a single death, we've sadly lost four more Vermonters in the last two weeks. And with over 148 positive cases reported yesterday, and 146 will be reported today, we continue to see very concerning growth. Every single one of us has a responsibility to help slow this down, protect our loved ones, and preserve our hospital capacity. What we need from you is to follow the restrictions we announced last week, including avoiding travel, as well as social gatherings with other households. I know this is especially hard with Thanksgiving less than a week away, but I urge you to take a look at our numbers, look at the rising hospitalizations and deaths, and look at the states around the country who are exceeding their hospital capacity. Also, think about the Vermonters we've lost. They were grandmothers, grandfathers, moms, dads, husbands, wives, and friends. The fact is, these deaths are increasing because the amount of virus in the community is increasing. And it's getting into facilities that care for our seniors. I'm pretty sure no one is doing this on purpose. But the fact is, this disease spreads so quickly and easily. It only takes one party where masks aren't worn, followed by an in-person meeting in a small room. Then a coworker returning home to a family member who happens to work at a nursing home. That's when it all becomes very real. This virus is so crafty and spreads so fast, and the consequences are severe. Maybe not for you or your household, but for others. That's why it's so important to follow our latest restrictions. As I told you we do by today, we went through the guidance to help clear things up and make sure everyone understands what we need from them, while also making sure what you can do is done safely. So first, to make sure no one feels trapped in an unsafe environment, the updated guidance makes clear. If you're in a dangerous or unhealthy situation, you can leave and take shelter with another household. Next, individuals who live alone may gather with one other household so they can stay connected with the, with the immediate family, but they must still limit contacts. And finally, outdoor fitness activities involving no more than two people from different households are allowed. This means you can take a walk with a friend, but you have to maintain your distance and wear a mask. I also want to reiterate that because cases continue to rise, Recreational sports are, unfortunately, still on hold, and all our actions announced last week will remain in place. Again, I cannot stress this enough. We need people to limit their contacts with others. And while I know this is hard, and I know many feel that after eight months, they've learned how to get together with others without risk, but that's just not the case according to our contact tracing data, which is why we have to do this and do it now. The CDC has also come out this week urging Americans across the country, country to avoid travel and avoid getting together with other households for Thanksgiving. Look, I know we're asking a lot and it's hard, but as Dr. Fauci has said, there is light at the end of this tunnel but we need to get to that light with all our friends and family there with us so we can celebrate in the months and years ahead. So that means we'll have to continue to make sacrifices, each and every one of us. And let's not forget that our sacrifices this spring and summer put us in a position to methodically reopen our economy, most of which is still open and let us safely reopen our schools this fall. That was and is a huge win for our kids, 
who greatly benefit from being physically back in their schools. Making sure we can continue to give them the chance to be in school with friends, and getting the help they need from teachers, which is best delivered face to face, is one of our top priorities. So to help remind everyone what we're all working towards, I've invited a couple of students here today to talk about why they're grateful to be back in school and the results of a survey they gave to their fellow students. Sabina and Anjalita, thank you so much for being here today. So I'll now turn it over to both of you. Thank you so much, Governor. I really appreciate you inviting us to be here. And, you know, both of us are so happy to be able to share um, this data with the state and people beyond the state board. Um, Anjalita and I gave this presentation to the state board this Wednesday that was a part of our student report. And we chose to do it in this fashion because in the past, I've been on the state board for a year now, and in the past, my student reports have been a simple just check-in as to how I'm doing at school and what life is like for me. And with a global pandemic going on, it came to my mind that we need to provide people with an understanding of what's going on on a broader um, platform and how are all students feeling, not just how Anilita and I are feeling at school. So I decided that a great way to do this would be to create a survey and send it out to different kids across the state. And so I want to say thank you to all the principals who made this possible and sent this survey out to their students and to the students who responded, because without them, we wouldn't have this data that's here in front of you today. I'm going to go ahead. Yeah, just really reiterating what Stephen said, we gathered a lot of really helpful information, and I think if we can get the Southwest Public School to understand how this is affecting their children and how it's affecting students across the state. So in total, we received 1,077 responses, and those responses were gathered between the 5th and 17th of October. And I think it's important to note that during that time frame, we had an average of 11 new cases a day. In the past week, we've had an average of 104 new cases a day. So this data obviously reflects a very different time. And if I can urge Vermonters to help us to get back to a time and place where we have 11 new cases a day on average, this will then allow us to look at this data and see this is actually how kids are doing. Because what we're about to show you is not going to exactly reflect how students currently feel at school. Next slide, please. So we surveyed a bunch of different high schools and uh, we thought it was important to kind of show the breakdown of the high schools because I myself am from CBU and we have such a large student body that you know almost 30% of our responses were from that school. But we did our best to get other schools and so that way the data would not be um, extremely biased with one high school. It is important to note that it was only high schools that were surveyed here and not any middle or elementary schools. Next slide, please. We also collected what grade people were in. Um, this isn't really that important. It was just something that when we sent this data to principals, we thought they would want to know and so we thought we would include it because we collected the data. Next slide, please. So this slide is just um, information on when students go to school, how many days they go to school. Um, most schools have been operating on two days a week and have been sending children to school Monday, Tuesday through Thursday and Friday. Again, this is not middle school. Middle school has been going five days a week. And this does not represent a uh, Montpelier because they have been, their cohorts are morning and afternoon. So that does not accurately reflect Montpelier. So as we can see, a majority of students have been going two days a week, and then the rest have either been staying home or been going one, three, four, five days a week. Next slide, please. So uh, this is just a tie graph on basic how these students feel protected at school. Um, it's good to see a majority over half of students feel, feel protected, um, 544, and then uh, 21% have said that they feel super protected and then the others feel 
that they're barely protected, not really protected, which is rare in this, and or not protected. Next slide, please. So then we broke down the data by high school just to kind of provide another way to look at it because obviously different high schools have different precautions in place and different numbers of students and that can affect how students feel. It's also important to note that this was how students feel so there is no real measure of how protected students actually are at school. But it, I felt that it was very important for people to know how do students physically feel while they're at school and not just, you know, what principals are saying, here's what we're doing, but students for the most part, feel somewhat protected while they're at school, and that's really important. Next slide, please. Um, so this is just going over why students feel protected. Um, over half are saying they have observed that other kids are wearing their masks properly, which is awesome. Um, there's been really good hand san uh, sanitization on tables, um, using hand sanitizer, cleaning anything that students touch, uh, social distancing, has been pretty good. I think that is based on the school and I can get more into that in the next slide. And outdoor classrooms I know have also been a rarity for some schools, but personal experience, my school has been doing pretty good with outdoor classrooms when we can and the weather isn't too cold. And my school's also been doing a really good job in sanitization. Can we go to the slide that says, while at school makes you feel not protected? There are three blue lines. So for this one, we um, kind of wanted to see, so of the students who were saying that they only felt somewhat protected, you know, what was making them not feel protected? And so not following social distancing was, was the biggest one. And I personally feel that while at school, that is definitely something that contributes to um, my personal feeling of um, safety, but also the improper mask usage is definitely something that kind of is a little, scary when I see someone not wearing a mask properly. So definitely just remembering the 6 C and wearing a mask properly is going to be a great way to help students feel protected. Um, the next slide should be what extracurriculars have you participated in since starting school this year. So we decided to survey kids on what they were doing um, outside of you know your classes from 8 to 3 o'clock because this is a huge part of the services that schools provide to students. They provide outlets for kids emotionally and physically to be able to go run around on a field after having a stressful day of learning inside is really helpful and beneficial for kids and their mental health. And so, as you can see, a large majority of students participate in extracurriculars. And this is kind of a part of that plea to Vermont to please be safe because if we're not safe over break and schools have to go fully virtual, a lot of these services and activities won't be available to kids and kids won't be able to participate in their winter sports season or attend school clubs in person. And simply having that touch point of attending perhaps, you know, GSA or RAC in person and seeing other spaces, not just over a screen, creates a great sense of community for a lot of kids. Next slide, please. particular aspect of their learning this fall was happening was a majority of kids doing some form of hybrid learning where a portion of their learning was done online. And so as you can tell, teachers who left their goals have put in so much work over the summer to try to learn how to teach online have done it. Students feel that they are 
learning better online. However, online learning is not the same as in person. So if we do have to go fully virtual, I think kids will be receiving a better education than they were in the spring, but it probably will not be better than an in-person education. Next slide, please. So this slide is kind of adding on to what Phoenix just now said. Online learning is not at all the same as in-person learning. We can see that the majority of students feel that it's worse or much worse than last fall learning, which is in person. We did not have this issue of having to go home and learn. Um, or it's the same, that we really came. Uh, about a third say that it's better or much better, which we could obviously make assumptions that most of these students are individual learners. But I think the key is we have to look at this and be like, wow, there are students that are really struggling. And I can obviously add my students. I know people that are really struggling, that are failing their courses. And this, we need to go back into school. And I, there are people that need to go back into school. People are, students are struggling to do online learning. They're saying it's worse and much worse. And there are more saying that it's worse or much worse than people saying that it's better. And there are people that are saying it's the same. And obviously we want things to be the same, but we want it to be a little better for students. We want them to like school. And I think today, 100% students are not liking school. It's hard. It's a struggle. There are some teachers that have not utilized the materials they have. And obviously, there are teachers that have utilized and have adapted. And they are helping the students as much as they can. But they also need to take care of students that don't come to school at all, that come on the other cohorts. So it's becoming a bit of an issue for some students, and most students are struggling, and that is why we need to bring things back to how they were last fall, which I feel like this graph really shows it all. Next. Yeah. I think another important thing to know about that is that at least at my school, we've had a change in how classes are taught because we're not able to be in school five days a week. So I haven't taken French or spoken a word of French since June. And I'm not taking French until next semester, meaning I'll have gone seven months without speaking that language. And having to now go into French for, you know, having more than just three months off that I would in the summer is going to be different. And it's definitely, you know, something that we need to understand is that our students are doing the best they can, but we also need to, as a community, support them and be safe with what we do because without um, mitigating the spread, you know, students are going to continue to suffer more and more, as our needs have said. So for hybrid learning, because a lot of students are doing this form, we kind of wanted to survey kids and how they felt the workload was. Because as I mean, like I said, for a lot of kids, while at home, it's very difficult to learn if you're not an independent learner. You know, having a classroom setting, an environment where there's a teacher there to provide support and other students who are doing the same work as you is extremely beneficial and is a great support system for kids who struggle to learn independently. And so we wanted to see how kids felt their workload was. And as you can see, it is all over the place, which is to be expected. There's different kids at different levels taking different level courses with different teachers. But I think you know it, it's important to note that we don't want kids to have to feel like they're having too much work or they're not giving, being given enough work while they're on their hybrid days. I've been fortunate enough that my teachers have been great about you know providing straightforward directions with online work. And there have been times that I felt it was a sufficient amount of work and it felt like I was you know getting um, a supplemental day in class, but just at home on my computer. But it's really not the same, and I think that's important. Just next slide, please. So this slide can really hit home for not for me, but for most for most students. Um, so we don't have a key, but the darker colors mean that teachers have not have struggled to reach out to students, and students feel that they have not been getting the guidance that they need from staff. And the lighter color means that they do feel that teachers have reached out and been a good support for students and that they have informed students of information like answering any questions or um, comments that they had. Um, so some schools have been doing great. Um, some schools have been answering 
staff has been really great with students. They've been answering questions. And then some uh, schools have not been. As you can see, um, Mount Abraham Union, which is my school, um, I can say that there, last year I had one or two teachers that I just emailed them something and they would get back to me in a month. And about a project that was already sent in. It, 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 I understand that family life is crazy, that um, they have to figure this all out and do. And we were trying to figure out all of that and how to reach out to students. And it was hard, and the internet sometimes doesn't work. It was just crazy bunch of factors. But this is the data that we collected. And this shows that there are times when some staff don't reach out to students. And that can be another level of just a barrier for students to learn. And it can just be another barrier uh, in students not completing the work at the level that they are capable of because we don't have the in-person learning. We don't have the teachers around us 24 seven to answer all the questions that we have. And sometimes, you know, we're too nervous that to send an email and they won't respond because we have seen that in the past with some teachers. So we choose to just not email them or just be silent about it. And I think we would have this problem if we went back to school. And if we were with our teachers and other um, students, we would not have the struggle of asking these questions and doing work as great as we can. And it's a seem that some teachers aren't reaching out to students, but it's often to see that a majority of teachers are. But I think what's important is that we focus on the very few teachers that aren't doing their job at the maximum level and that are, these teachers might be struggling as well and we need to be able to support them so that they can support their students. This whole thing is great. I understand. But if you keep going out and you're not wearing a mask properly and you're going to gatherings even though people else you shouldn't, you are putting your kids at risk. That's how it is. You are putting us in a situation where we're going to have to go back to school, back home, school and I can say for a fact students are failing and they're not passing their classes and they may not pass them this year and we need to get ourselves back to school. Teachers are struggling and I know that I've gone to school and teachers feel like this is hard. Like I don't know if I can juggle all of this and I will have something that I did a month ago finally be graded. So I yeah. <laughs> I know it, it is really difficult. I mean, the the in person is is such a huge, you know, importance. And and for the people who are like, well, I just want to see my family over break. You know, we just want to be in school in person. And so we have to learn to make those small sacrifices so that kids can go back to feeling protected while they're at school. Because I know I'm scared to go to school after Thanksgiving break. I don't know that I want to go into the building because I know for a fact that there are going to be kids that are going to travel and get exposed and possibly bring it to school. And I don't want to bring that home to my family. And so taking the proper precautions, if you do travel, please quarantine for 14 days or get tested after seven because you know, kids are the future of Vermont and you know, we don't want to be putting them at risk or their education. We want Vermont students to be uh, being provided the best education we can provide them and having online learning is not how we do that. There is a reason school has been five days a week in person in the past because that's how it works best. So I want to thank everyone who helped make this happen and open it up to questions. Um, thank you so much, uh, Sabina and Anya Lita. Uh, very well done, and uh, and we uh, we get a better picture of what's going on with you. And I hope adults were listening as well, because we need to make sure our students not only are safe in schools, but feel safe in schools as well. And both are linked uh, to how much virus we're seeing in our communities. At this point in time, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Secretary French for more uh, on our schools. Uh, thank you, Governor. Good morning, and uh, thank you, uh, Sabina and, and uh, Anuita. 
Uh, they're both really uh, exceptionally um, strong student representatives to the State Board of Education, and I think it's uh, something we should encourage all our boards to include student representatives, because they do, do add a lot of value to board deliberations, particularly in education. Uh, so, you know, the case counts um, are increasing. Our schools, however, continue to operate safely. Um, I was discussing the situation uh, with Dr. Raska, who's one of our infectious disease experts this week. Uh, and he observed that the data in Vermont across the nation, particularly in Western Europe, uh, is reassuring and that schools can operate safely during this pandemic. Uh, yesterday, the Vermont chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics issued a statement supporting this perspective. Uh, in their statement, they said, we have always known that there would be cases of COVID-19 in schools because schools reflect what is happening in the community. We continue to see that schools are not a main driver of transmission in this pandemic. The fact that there have been a number of cases where an infectious person has entered a K-12 learning environment and has not transmitted the virus highlights the effectiveness of the mitigation strategies we have in place in Vermont. The Children's Hospital at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center also issued a statement this week and underscores the importance of keeping our schools open for in-person instruction and recommended that schools remain open even as case counts increase. To quote from their statement, our recommendation is based on our assessment that the considerable detriment to the long-term education and mental health of an entire generation due to school closure outweighs the low rates of infection in children the generally mild severity of illness when they are infected and the lower likelihood of transmission from children than adults. Indeed, based on our experience so far, schools may be among the, the safest safe settings for children and staff. Our schools are operating safely thanks to the terrific work of our school staff and school board members. Uh, we continue to ask a lot of them and they continue to step up in service of their students, their schools and their communities. We asked more of them this week when we implemented the first round of our testing, uh, the surveillance testing for COVID-19 in our schools. Largely thanks to their efforts, this complex undertaking has gone very smoothly. Uh, we're completing the first week of this testing today. By the end of the day today, we expect to have tested about 45% of all school staff statewide. Uh, that's about 9,500 tests. The results of this testing will start to propagate over through the normal Department of Health reporting processes and next week we'll provide a more specific um, update on that information. We're now planning the second phase of the testing which will start the week of November 30th. During this phase we'll test 25% uh, of our schools each week during December except for the last week of the month. Each school testing group will contain a mixed geographic sample of schools so we'll have insight uh, every week into the prevalence of the virus across the state. Um, also, uh, every month we collect data on how schools are implementing in-person, remote, and hybrid learning. Uh, I'd like to make some observation on that data. I don't know if we have the slides on that or not. Do we have the PowerPoint up? Or? If not, that's all right. I'll just, I'll go through it. This is the monthly survey we enacted at the start of school. Um, the first time we did administer it, um, it was at the end of September, you might recall. So the results from September represented uh, where schools were as a result of reopening. Um, by the end of October, which are the results that we have uh, this week, uh, we can see that basically uh, the, the amount of in-person instruction has doubled uh, since the reopening of school. And this was as of the end of October, um, as both Sabina and Annalita pointed to, that's a moment in time before the case count increased significantly. Um, but essentially, as we predicted, the in-person instruction would increase. It's essentially doubled through the month of October. And most of that increase occurred at the elementary level. We didn't see much change in the high school or middle levels, but essentially all of that change is attributed to elementary schools, um, doubling the amount of in-person, which is really good considering uh, those students are, I'll say, more vulnerable from an educational and developmental perspective. Um, there's not much change in the status of our independent schools. We surveyed them as well. Uh, they continue to offer about 50% of in-person instruction for their students, uh, but we only we have a limited sample of the independent schools. Only 40% of them responded to the survey. Uh, that's not unusual. There's a lot of many very, very small independent schools across the state, and there's a large number of them. Uh, so it's hard to draw further inferences from that data, but that's, that's heartening to know that they continue to maintain a 50% in-person rate. Um, and the last piece on our data is the CTE centers. They continue to implement a hybrid uh, learning format. 
Um, I imagine this represents uh, their shift that they did fairly early on uh, with moving a lot of their academic side of their programs to online platforms and keeping the in-person for their shop or lab environments. Um, they also have uh, several programs such as their business fields that lend themselves fairly well to online learning. So I think uh, we could expect that CT centers will stay in that hybrid format for some time. Um, that concludes my update. Um, I'll now turn it over to Dr. Levine. Morning, everyone. We're continuing to see our case counts reach new heights. As you can see, we're closing in on 3,500 cases as a state. Yesterday, we reported our highest daily number of cases, 148. We will be reporting, as you can see in the very right bar, 146 today. This gives you a bit of a graphic visualization of this, because the picture is always uh, worth a thousand words to get a sense for just the months of September now through mid-November. As you would expect, as we have more positive cases, uh, we are keeping up with testing in abundance. But our percent positivity rate will go higher uh, as there are more cases. So our seven-day average percent positivity rate 1.87%. November 17th was 1.40%. Keep in mind, most of the pandemic, we've been uh, in the 1% or even fraction of 1% range. These are still well within our guardrails, as uh, we've called them. And uh, just to give you some perspective, um, states like New Jersey are now well in the 6 to 10% range. Some states in the Midwest uh, are 10 to 20 percent. South Dakota's close to 50-ish percent. One thing that we did note um, a little earlier in the month, and it's subtle, but the slight blip in our syndromic surveillance. That means people presenting to urgent care centers or emergency departments with symptoms of COVID. That blip has somewhat come down a little since, and we'll have to keep watching that very closely. And then finally, um, just to round out, I may not show another slide like this again, uh, the Central Vermont um, ice teams outbreak beginning way back in the beginning of October. We're now in mid November, and since November 6th, there have been only two cases uh, related to the college campus, actually, which is the tertiary infection. Um, so we're seeing that uh, outbreak truly uh, decay, if you will, um, which is great. This morning, uh, we reported 15 hospitalizations. The peak we've had for hospitalizations has been 21. So that's uh, a favorable direction, at least. And two of those were in the ICU and no one on a ventilator. Again, I think testimony to the kind of care we're able to provide in hospitals and in ICUs now for COVID patients. That's it for the slides. Um, yesterday, we reported a total of 24 outbreaks in 163 situations. And to remind people, situations are instances when contact tracing identifies a possible exposure in a facility that warrants a follow-up with the facility above and beyond notifying the contacts. Most of the time, these situations involve a few cases or even just one case, but it might be present in a school, in a workplace, or a healthcare facility. And that's why it becomes a situation. When we learn about more than one case in a facility and it seems likely that transmission took place at the facility, we then reclassify that as an outbreak. 
Though cases are up everywhere in the state, we continue to see a significant proportion of new cases in Washington County residents who we have met with previously, uh, and they are taking extra steps, the officials in these counties, to help stop the spread of the virus, such as closing town offices. At least one community has opted to move their schools to remote learning, though this is not a general public health recommendation at this time, but we do certainly respect the considerations such as staffing that go into these very difficult decisions. And as the governor stated, we have now sadly had a total of four deaths in just the past two weeks. This includes most recently residents of long-term care facilities, the places where we know that COVID-19 has in Vermont been so devastating and can be so devastating. Each life we've lost to COVID-19 reminds us that many Vermonters simply can't protect themselves from the virus. So it is up to us to protect one another. And that is why we want every Vermonter, even those who are young and healthy, to avoid the virus by avoiding gatherings, as this is how workers in schools and long-term care facilities and other work sites are innocently and unintentionally able to bring the virus into those facilities, especially at a time where there is more prevalence of the virus in our communities. Now, as we see case counts mount, it's easy to think the worst, that there's no end in sight. But this is not a runaway train yet. It's picking up speed, but we can get it under control if we all work together. Our contact tracing teams are working around the clock under the increasing burden of cases. We are training new people in their ranks, and we're working with partners to help ensure that everyone who needs to be contacted is reached as quickly as possible, because that is how one contains this virus. But we can only do it with your help, avoiding social gatherings, limiting non-essential travel, quarantining when necessary, and taking prevention steps will help stem this rising tide, but only if Vermonters follow the guidance. It is still too soon to see an impact of the guidance we announced last Friday and that went into effect Saturday night on our case numbers, and it may take many weeks yet. Cases we see today result from exposures before the new executive order went into effect. Cases will peak before they can come down, but with a little patience and a lot of a compliance, I'm hopeful that we can make a real difference. We've done it before, and we can certainly do it again. Anecdotally, I'm hearing from many Vermonters that they're noticing less people on the streets and less people in restaurants. Not that we've told them not to go into the restaurants, by the way, uh, but they seem less crowded. And I've personally heard multiple stories from friends and from people I don't even know who tell me that they've changed their Thanksgiving plans. And though we all should have fewer people we're in contact with these days, I also again ask Vermonters to keep track of anyone you do come into contact with, whether you write it down on a paper or note it on your phone. This will make our contact tracing work much easier. As we said before, this is a new phase of the pandemic where we need to ensure hospitals are not overwhelmed, keep as many Vermonters working as possible, and certainly, as you heard from these students, help schools continue to offer in-person instruction. We have seen cases in K-12 schools, a reflection of the unfortunate reality in our communities right now. But importantly, instances of transmission of virus in school have been very limited and not led to large outbreaks. This shows that they can operate safely. And a case in a school rarely results in a closure of a school and only occasionally of a class. Though, of course, they are very disruptive to everyone there. We know how critical in-person learning is, not only for academics, but also for kids' health and social and developmental needs. Meanwhile, as Secretary French told you, our surveillance testing of teachers is well underway with 
45% of the 18,000 school staff having been tested, and we expect by the end of the day today, slightly over 50% of the staff may have been tested, which is truly a remarkable and gratifying turnout. This is all to say it takes a lot of hard work from our schools, parents, and communities to get to the place where we could open safely. Now it's our job to keep them open. By keeping COVID out of our communities, we can keep them out of our schools. I know it's hard to rethink our lives and daily activities again, to plan a Thanksgiving in our own homes without other family or guests, to still face uncertainty about what's coming next. But if we can understand and accept what needs to be done now, we can still prevent further spread and tragedy. I have two things I'd like to end with, first of which I'll call a reality check. Let's face it, we all know there are some people out there, hopefully a small minority, who we don't want to follow the rule, who, who don't want to follow the rules, or might be pressuring you actually to come over for the holidays. Our website has what we call some COVID talk. Tips to help you navigate these situations. But if you're in one of these situations, know that you can tell others what you need to to feel safe. Blaming and shaming may actually increase pushback and the likelihood of risk-taking behaviors. It's okay to be clear and straightforward, to decline invitations or leave situations that feel too risky. You should never have to feel bad or apologize for prioritizing your safety. In fact, your true friends will be very understanding. The second thing I'd like to end on with another message of hope is an update on vaccines. It's expected that by the end of the day today, Pfizer will be filing for emergency use authorization for their vaccine candidate. The Advisory Council on Immunization Practices, which advises the CDC, will be meeting next Monday, but probably not in a voting fashion, just for information only. The council that advises the FDA will be meeting in the second week of December. We expect that the committee that advises the CDC will again meet in an emergency sense shortly thereafter, and perhaps the earliest Vermont could see a vaccine on its doorsteps for a limited number of doses would be in the range of December 10th. I'll turn things back to the governor now. Thank you, Dr. Levine. We'll open it up to questions at this time. All right, it is 11.51, and we have 25 or 26 people in the queue. So please uh, keep your questions limited. We'll start with Calvin. Uh, thanks, Governor. So you mentioned um, the slight change in guidance about outdoor um, fitness, you know, outdoor walks or a go. What about outdoor um, recreation, I'm thinking, for kids, play groups, that sort of thing? Um, I think the recreation, whatever we have for outdoor recreation at this point is the same uh, as previously, but we'll check on that to be sure. Um, but this is really about the household contacts, um, bringing people together from different households. And we had said, as you recall last week, uh, that we didn't want any uh, interaction whatsoever. And there was some, some significant question uh, about that. And uh, we, uh, we wanted to inject some common sense and be sure that people who wanted to, to, to bike together or, or hike together or walk together uh, could do so, but no more than two at a time. And I wanted to get your thoughts on the unemployment um, report that just came out this morning. It's down to about 3.2%, I think. What are your overall thoughts on it? And, um, and a second point as well, um, it appears that PUA, without further action from Congress, uh, will expire on the 26th of December. Um, how is the state preparing potentially for more Yeah, well, well, again, uh, you, you know, I've been concerned about the uh, methods used in terms of determining what our, our employment uh, and unemployment is. So uh, I'll leave that there because I'm still very concerned. And I believe we'll see an uptick in unemployment and those uh, filing over the next uh, month or two just because of the construction season and so forth. Uh, as well, I'm very, very concerned uh, about the PUA running out um, by the 
uh, for shortly in some respects, uh, certainly in this year. Um, and uh, we've made our concerns now uh, to the, uh, the Secretary of Labor, uh, but, uh, but also uh, to try and determine what we can do about it with our congressional delegation. But we need Congress to act. We need to have them act on something. And this, in particular, is going to be uh, crucial, I believe, uh, for many uh, to, uh, to get through this, because we don't have the capacity, we don't have the, the resources uh, to, to pay unemployment uh, without their changing the guidelines and rules. So um, if there's one thing they should act on, this is it. Uh, but there certainly is other opportunities for uh, more economic relief, uh, as well as uh, uh, taking care of people uh, during these trying times, because we have, you know, we, we, we have some light at the end of the tunnel, uh, we need to get there, though, and uh, we're going to need their help in order to do that. David? Uh, thank you. Um, so Killington opens today. Stowe is expecting to open up next week. Um, and, uh, Killington on the website has a quote mentioning uh, that they're, you know, given the nature of the requirements, I'll just read it here, it says they're unable to verify if visitors to the resort meet the requirements, but we urge you to do the right thing and not travel to Vermont or our resort if you don't meet the requirements. So essentially, um, another example of hoping, asking people to do the right thing, but without being able to verify it. Um, does the state have any further guidance to resorts or um, anything they can do to help uh, try and, and make sure the requirements are met, especially you know, as, as yeah. Vermonters are asked to sort of? Well, the, the resorts and ski areas do have uh, that guidance, and they have to, uh, guidance, and they have to attest uh, to uh, the uh, restrictions we have in place. Uh, if they fail to, um, they can lose their privileges to ski in Vermont. They'll get their passes pulled. Um, so I think there is some incentive for those uh, coming from other states. They need to quarantine, plain and simple. Uh, if they don't, uh, and if they are uh, not truthful uh, and they're attesting and we find out, we're, we'll urge the ski areas to pull their passes. And that was the agreement we have with the uh, with the ski areas, but I might ask uh, Secretary Curley, I believe, uh, to elaborate further on this. Secretary Curley, are you on? She is on. Yeah. Yeah, we can hear you now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, our team has worked closely with the ski industry and they've been incredibly good partners in developing guidelines. They're the strictest in the country. And um, as you mentioned, Governor, there are some strong, um, strong, uh, let's say, asks of them in terms of requiring attestations from their peers that they have met the quarantine requirements. And we've required them to, to provide a great deal of educational messaging around our quarantine and our cross-state travel policy, um, something that's also supported by our tourism and marketing team. So um, we're really hopeful that um, they can provide a safe and healthy experience for Vermonters and those that can meet the quarantine requirements. So um, it's hard to tell them the first day, but fingers are crossed that things will go well. Do we know if, if how they're able to verify that, or is it just a matter of asking people if they've complied and, and does it sort of get left there? And I guess that's, you know, partly for ski resorts and partly for other businesses where we're sort of asking them to do that, I guess. I don't know if you heard that, uh, Secretary Curley, or not. Was the question how, did this, how do the ski areas determine that? Yeah, or any business in some respects. Yeah, so um, we left it up to the ski areas to find an appropriate path to do that. So. You might imagine that when they sell a ski ticket, um, they would ask for that attestation to be signed at the same time. There might be a variety of other ways that they have folks with ski passes, uh, annual passes, for example. They may be checking them as they're coming into the, the resort. Um, and again, we left that to them to, to figure out a path forward. Uh, we're also seeing uh, retailers, for example, and restaurant owners who are on their own doing the same thing, asking folks who are coming into their business to attest that they understand the, 
the guidelines and that they have um, met those guidelines. So again, um, feeling very, really positive that Vermont employers want to stay open and they're doing everything they can to make sure that, that we can keep the economy open. And they have to make sure, they have to give their uh, contact information as well, uh, full contact information for those in restaurants as well as those going to uh, ski areas in particular. And we'll move now to the phones to Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Yes, good morning. Hey, um, I'm a hospital, hospital prepared for a set of certifications. Do they have the space of staff and the equipment for a surge? And what's going to happen if a medical uh, staff member, the certain medical staff member, who gets sick? And we're also hearing from people who can get do-it-yourself kits online. And why are those results coming back within 24 hours and so invasive? But the hospital test takes like five days. That's something. Secretary Smith. Chris, thank you for the question. As you know, we're, uh, the hospitals are getting ready with their surge plans uh, and have, uh, have done a very good job in, in preparing for any surge. As you know, we have seen an uptick in hospitalizations, but nothing that comes to the limit that we have in the availability of both uh, medical surgical beds as well as ICU beds. We also have uh, plenty of ventilators in, in, uh, in stock as well and, and on the front line. Uh, we also are opening up surge capacity at the Champlain Valley Expo, and we have surge capacity forward based in Rutland with a mobile hospital as well. So I think um, we're in pretty good shape, uh, obviously. Uh, healthcare in general uh, gets, um, contracts the virus probably in terms of any sort of uh, healthcare workers in general usually contract a virus at a higher rate than the general public. Uh, but at the same time, the hospitals have been able to keep staffed uh, during this entire pandemic. And I don't expect anything to change in that regard. Now that I've been talking, I forgot the second part of your question, Chris. Yeah, we're wondering why the do-it-yourself kits that are available online come back so quickly. Some in some cases within 24 hours, but will the hospital test take about five days? Yeah, there are, right now we're, we monitor the hospital uh, testing as well as our own testing. We make sure that it's about 48 hours uh, at the most uh, in our testing. Our state lab is within 24 hours. There has been some backlog on national labs. Um, I bet that in a few days, if there's more and more of those tests being used, you're going to see a backlog as, on those as well, because in many cases, those have to go to a lab. And in some cases, those labs, those national labs, are being backed up because of uh, uh, the, the incident of the virus in other states. We've been fortunate, the labs that we've been using uh, at, at the state level, both the state lab and Broad Institute have been very good in Broad is 1.8 uh, days for a return of, of uh, results. Our own state lab is about 24 hours in terms of results. Um, but we have seen in some of the systems that there are uh, some delays in national labs. We met with hospitals yesterday. We asked them to suspend going to certain labs and go to labs that have uh, faster turnarounds. Uh, they, I met with the uh, UVM network. They have agreed to do that, uh, to move to different labs that have faster turnarounds, and we will continue. Dr. Levine, do you have anything to add on sort of the, the self-administered test? And I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine. I'm thinking you're referring to the test that was just in the news, uh, I guess, a few days ago. Um, 
that would naturally re return within 24 hours because you actually do it at home and you get the result at home. This is a similar test to PCR, but not exactly identical. It's a, called a molecular amplification test. It uses what's called LAMP technology. I'm not aware that it's actually available everywhere yet, and it was particularly targeted at two sort of settings where it was going to be piloted more. However, uh, if there are actually people in Vermont who've had it, it probably will play a role at some point. It's not clear yet if it's uh, as sensitive as the current technology that we use, and uh, it would cost approximately $50 per test uh, for the individual to purchase what, it, what they needed to do it. Um, but they would have a result very, very quickly. So at times when things are surging around the country, that may be a very, very useful test to have. But I can't really comment on its use in Vermont at this time because we have really no awareness of it uh, being here in Vermont. Okay, thank you. Joe, the Barton Chronicle. Good morning, Governor. Um, I have a pair of questions that I think are related. Uh, both of them came from readers. Uh, in one of them, a woman says her daughter, who is a registered nurse at a hospital not in our area, is very concerned because she said they have not been doing uh, baseline testing for COVID at her hospital and in nearby uh, businesses there has been such testing with results short 20% positivity. Uh, I think it's over a border in that case and not in Vermont. But um, And the second question is from someone who said that a business near his uh, had a cluster of cases in one department, five cases. Uh, a sixth worker in that department was never contacted by contact tracing and also worked in another business in Burlington. Um, there the owner said there was no reason for him not to come to work because he hadn't been uh, contacted by the contact tracers. Um, I don't know what to say to any of these people, but I figure you or Dr. Levine or Secretary Smith might have something to say. I'll uh, refer this to Dr. Levine. So on the second instance, let me start there. Um, hard to say anything because obviously we, we need details and we need to understand the nature of the work site and if the sixth worker actually had an important exposure and opportunity to become a true contact, in which case that worker should be quarantined. So um, by our methodology, if that worker was very much aligned with the other five and in their presence at all times at the work site versus worked in an office and never uh, actually interacted with them, that would be important for us to know. So uh, that's how we do contact tracing and make sure that we connect with people who need to be connected. This would be considered one of those situations that I referred to in my talk uh, because it's at a work site involving a number of people there. So I'm sure we're on top of that um, and that the right outcome has occurred. But without details, I, I can't say anything more. On the first uh, question, um, part of reopening the healthcare sector uh, was surveillance testing on healthcare workers. And each of the hospital sites had to submit a plan that they would actually acknowledge that they understood that and show the uh, testing protocol they were going to employ for their employees. So without knowing again further details, all I can tell you is that is what we have uh, been doing all along since we reopened the healthcare sector a number of months ago. Um, and we would hope that what your reader uh, was questioning uh, was not in um, violation of that. Uh, Secretary Smith may want to fill in one more comment. But. 
Joe, I'm going to take this opportunity to also go a little bit uh, outside the bounds of your question and, and just mention one of the things we also met with the, the University of Vermont yes, yesterday, and I believe St. Mike's is doing the same. If you have a positive student on campus and you are releasing your students, that positive student, and I hope the parents understand why this is being done, that positive student will remain in isolation until the, until the period that it's safe to release uh, that student. So that student would remain on campus in isolation until that, uh, that student is free of the virus. We are going to be reaching out to all colleges in Vermont to make sure that that policy is uh, implemented throughout the college and university system here in Vermont. And the reason for that is that we do not want positive college students uh, being sent home to their communities. It's safer to keep them on campus at this moment in isolation until they have passed the infection period. So Joe, I took your question and went a little sideways on it because I needed the opportunity to say that. Thank you, it's better than my question anyway. <laughs> Hey, Joe, can I, uh, I just want to clarify, did you say that the, the hospital uh, in question might be outside of Vermont borders, possibly in? No, the hospital in question was in Vermont, it was outside Vermont. Got it, okay, all right, thank you. All right, next is Lee Young, and Lee, thank you for Hi, um, I was wondering about just I guess some of the messaging that um, that you've been doing this week, Governor. Um, you know, you, you've been talking a lot about people needing to follow these these guidelines and um, been speaking in some ways more strongly than we've heard throughout this pandemic about the need for people to, to really follow these rules and invoking patriotism. And so, I, I was wondering if you feel like the public health guidance that you're issuing right now is, is really reaching everyone in Vermont and that, that you're getting the the response that you need from it. It seems to me like you're concerned that, that not everyone's hearing you. And, and if so, what other ways besides these press conferences are you trying to reach out to to tell people who might be, um, who might not understand the situation? Yeah, we're, uh, thank you, uh, Liam. And uh, we're using all the channels we have at our disposal within state government uh, to get this out. Um, we're counting on all of you as well, the media, uh, to send the message. And, and I've got to say, you've, you've done a, a great job over the last few days in trying to do that. Um, and uh, we look for any opportunities to, to make sure that we message in the proper way, because not everybody uh, reads some of the stories that are, that are, are um, printed. Uh, some don't hear it on the radio. Some don't see uh, it on uh, TV. And they certainly don't uh, listen to our press conferences uh, on uh, twice a week. So uh, we just need all, yeah, all all of us pulling in the same direction and trying to get it out uh, to the best of our ability, because um, it really is in our individual uh, hands uh, to put uh, to to try and uh, confront this and defend this uh, over the next uh, uh, few weeks uh, until a vaccine is uh, widely distributed. Um, and I, and I also uh, would say. <clears throat> We won't know uh, whether we're having an effect uh, for at least maybe a couple of weeks. Um, since the measures take a little bit of time, there's a lag time in between, uh, seeing if they were beneficial. So I'm still hopeful, uh, but we, we can't uh, let up. We need to continue to message this uh, over the next couple of weeks uh, to have an effect. So uh, again, if you have any ideas, uh, we uh, would welcome them. And, uh, and try and, and, again, urge all of the media to do all you can to get that message out as well. And Liam, uh, the State Emergency Operations Center recently you know, collected a bit of a list, a inventory of other ways that we're reaching out, including partner outreach. I'd be happy to provide you with sort of an itemized list if that's helpful. Thank you. Um, and then just a, a kind of a quick uh, follow up around around that and that kind of lag and we won't know how these guidelines work for a little while. Um, 
with the do we currently have the contact tracing staff um, to, to deal with the, the high number of cases we've been seeing this week and we'll probably continue to see some high numbers for for a little while going forward have yeah. we reached that the point where we're able to, to contact trace effectively yeah again the contact tracing team has been stressed as you might imagine at this point we did get a bit of a break on one day uh, this week when it went down to like 50. Uh, and uh, we're adding people all the time, training and adding. Uh, I think they have a, a great plan in place and, uh, and they're going to scale up uh, to a point where we have uh, probably two to three times the contact tracers uh, that we've had uh, initially and, and uh, even over the last uh, month or so. So I feel good about the plan. I don't know if Secretary Smith has anything you want to add to that to maybe give some numbers? We've been spending, and Dr. Levine can add on to this if he if he desires. We've been spending a lot of time on two fundamental issues: testing capacity, which we've ramped up significantly in this state, where we hope to have the capacity to do 30,000 Vermonters in uh, a week, in turn, and that's excluding colleges who will be ramping down as they send their students home. The second area is contact tracing, and, and we are bringing on staff in the next uh, few days here. Uh, yesterday we brought on uh, 33 additional staff. Now, I, wanna, I, I don't want to confuse you because this, if I use staff, I, I want to use FTEs. So we hope to have by uh, today about, um, about 55 to 56 uh, FTEs doing contact tracing. Each of those contact tracers can do two to three cases a day. So you can see that we are moving into the 150 range in terms of being able to handle the surge that we have seen. But that's not where it's gonna stop. We're gonna go up 20 in um, on by Monday. We'll go up another 10 on the following Monday and we'll go up another 20 uh, or so uh, the following week so that we'll have the ability to contact trace large number of people. We've also reorganized um, the contact tracing so that we can not only interview um, a case, but I, for lack of better words, I'll call it tiger teams that will reach out uh, to the cases that are identified as quickly as possible to get them to um, stay in place and give them the information, including Sarah alerts, to those con close contacts of those individuals. So there's a lot going on. Um, at, at the height of it, we should be able to be uh, between 250 and 300 uh, a day uh, over the course of the next couple of weeks. Dr. Levine? You, you mean 200 to, that, um, 200 to 300 cases a day? A cases a day. Obviously, I showed you a lot of uh, pictures this morning. So obviously, we'd see that graph um, going to exponential growth. So um, there are states nearby who have gone from usual place in the low 100s to the mid 200s to the 300s to now the 500s, all in a pretty quick time course. We're not seeing that just yet. Um, so we're going to be obviously watching for that kind of growth. But at the same time, again, I have to stress that Saturday night, meaning Sunday, really, is not that many days back. And uh, we, were, we would anticipate continued increases in our case growth based on what was going on in our population prior to the new orders and the new restrictions. So. Uh, we have to learn to feel comfortable 
with the kinds of numbers we've been seeing the past couple of nights or even a little higher because that would not be unexpected. And we would hope that later on, um, 10, 14 plus days after we started, we would start to see the plateauing and decrease. Obviously, we also look at all the other metrics. I mentioned just the case growth, but we would look at the percent positivity rate. We would look at the hospitalization rate. All of the usual metrics that we continue to follow literally daily, if not more than once a day. And so we've heard that there might have been a handful of cases out of a Berlin uh, facility for older residents. Is there any information you can share about that? Um, that's exactly what I could share. <laughs> what you said. Uh, there's not there's not much else to say beyond that. Obviously, a situation we're watching very closely. Um, and I can say that, you know, like I've said before, there are schools, there are long-term care facilities all throughout the state that are situations, sometimes turn into outbreaks, but they've been, by and large, modest and uh, been contained and very small. Um, the, the couple that we have watched and talked about here that have been bigger are the exceptions right now, not the rule. But we want them to remain the exceptions, and that's why our communities have to have less virus being transmitted within them, hence the changes we've made. Okay, thank you. Aaron, VT Digger. You mentioned that um, four deaths in the past couple days or weeks are connected to long-term care facilities. Uh, how many of those four are actually connected to long-term care, exactly? Yeah. I think you just said including. Yeah, I, th I don't think I, I, I think the right answer is three, but I don't think I, I said that they were all connected to long-term care facilities. Maybe you did, Dr. Levine. I didn't say all. Yeah, sorry, I misspoke. You said including long-term care facilities. Right. I believe the answer is three. Okay. And the facility um, has put on a release tonight. Yeah, I and, uh, and, and the facility, yeah. has, facility has released a, a news release to that effect, that there were three deaths. Okay, I just wanted to confirm that. And, um, you know, with the Rutland outbreak, you know, the way that we first heard about it is after a reporter asked about a press conference, and now we're hearing about a Berlin outbreak or potential situation because the reporter asked about a press conference. Why doesn't the state release facility by facility data the way it does for schools and prisons um, and other correctional facilities? So, um, it seems like a no-brainer that this is something that is important to understanding the impact of COVID in the state. No, absolutely. Uh, to correct you, though, as we corrected the prior reporter uh, one or two press conferences ago, we did actually talk about the Rutland facility uh, at a press conference initially. Um, uh, and that's because it was a large event. Uh, as I said today, you know, we're in the range of 200 situations. Uh, I could just stand here and not have any comments each day and just read a list of every facility in the state that's been affected by the virus. I would submit to you that would not be productive because we have enough virus in our communities that people are going to be going to their work sites, schools, and long-term care facilities and bringing the virus with them. Uh, so that's why, you know, it, it would be um, just a random thing to pick one over another. Um, certainly we could give you, uh, within each category, the number of schools, the number of long-term cares, the number of correctional facilities, and that might be useful information uh, and would be easy to assemble. Again, there's no effort here to not be transparent but we'd like to provide you with useful information. Um, and that's all I'll say. Well, um, I don't think that you should read off all 200 situations at the press conference. That's why I'm asking why you don't release the data as part of, say, 
the data portal, on the health department website, you know, New Jersey, which has a similar percentage of deaths attributed to long-term care, publishes a daily total of nursing home deaths uh, in its data dashboard and also publishes a PDF of every facility's cases. Why isn't Vermont in that? And five nursing homes, I, I'm referring to all long-term care for the record. Yeah, so uh, we could provide that data if that's something that you're interested in having. Um, absolutely. We, we tend to have such yeah. small, we tend to have such small numbers in any one setting that we do risk uh, breaching confidentiality for people in that setting. So we have to be careful. Our numbers are usually very small. Yeah, I mean, I would say that we had the similar concerns for schools and you guys arrived at a compromise you found acceptable. Yes, we have a website that we just list number of cases within a school so so i agree we could do the same and we will definitely look into that and appreciate your uh, recommendation thanks that's all mike donahue the islander thanks rebecca uh just as a follow-up while this press conference was underway i did get from the health department response to my public records request about the recent outbreak i'm still digesting it but what struck me that the list includes at least two pharmacies that are not publicly identified. Shouldn't Vermonters who are seeking healthcare information during a pandemic and they go to their local pharmacy at least understand whether their pharmacy is one of those places? Uh, I see on the list the UVM custodial staff, to see Valley Vista listed, and, and the other part of this, the question is at what point does a private event outbreak, whatever? some of them having 16 or 17 people impacted, really become a public event. One of those public private events spread six cases to a long-term facility your, your email said. Yeah, Mike, so thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, there will be numerous pharmacies that will say that they have a case eventually. Um, and a case in a worker in a pharmacy does not necessarily mean um, a typhoid Mary situation where because you walk in the door of that pharmacy you are uh, indebted and, and going to get COVID. Um, there are cases in some of our very large retailers across the country all the time almost never requiring those facilities to close and almost never providing a risk to the public who attends those facilities. Um, so it's, it's a very fine line to walk with just identifying a place that someone may have been going to for 20 years for their prescription and then saying one of the workers there tested positive for COVID um, and that they should never go in the door again uh, because that would be not the way things work and not the level of risk that the public would be uh, exposed to. Um, as I keep saying, as it's in... As the, as the virus is in our community, it comes with us to wherever we go in that community. And that's why we are recommending what we're recommending uh, these days, period. Yeah, and shouldn't the Vermonter have that choice rather than withholding it from them so they can't make their own personal choice as to whether they want to go to that pharmacy or move to somewhere else? Shouldn't it be the Vermonter and not who knows who, not disclosing it. Well, the, perhaps that Vermonter would have no choice then because there might be two pharmacies in their community and a supermarket in their community that has a pharmacy and there's been a case in each one of those. What would they do then? Um, hopefully they would trust that the right isolation and quarantine processes have occurred and that there's no risk for them for entering that place on a, on a specific day. Okay, and as a follow-up, uh, we've been flooded with questions from across the state about the latest state order, and one of the common themes is maybe the inconsistency in the state orders. And like one reader notes, they can't go, their spouse can't go out for a running partner or a walk with a long-time running partner, but they're free to go teach school to 15, 20 kids in a classroom that are coming in who knows where from and with who they've been 
this other reader says, uh, why is it safe for all Vermonters to be out and in work and in school, but state office and management have been told to telework at home until the end of March. Why is it safe for children and workers to be completely safe, but apparently the state doesn't think it's safe for their own workers? Yeah, Mike, so uh, to reiterate the governor's comments from the beginning of the press conference, the concern about having a running mate or a walking mate uh, has been taken care of with a clarification. Um, and uh, we do understand uh, that the impact that will have on people's lives in a very positive way. Uh, we certainly want to reduce the opportunity for an older Vermonter to be socially isolated if there's a person they habitually walk with every day outside. The difference is, uh, for what you were asking, there are some circumstances where things are highly regimented and where there is guidance provided, and very specific guidance to ensure that social distancing and masking and avoidance of crowded situations is part of the conditions for being open at all. Then there are other circumstances, for instance, a group of walkers wanting to go on a trail together who are not wearing masks and who are within six feet of each other at numerous times, that would be much more dangerous. So that's the distinction in those areas. Um, in the areas of schools, obviously we've made the case this morning for why uh, in-person education is the preferable route. And we have very specific guidance that schools have that I won't repeat today that ensure the safety of students and teachers. And the students actually presented a very compelling case to us this morning about the fact that the majority of them actually feel some sense of safety in terms of masking, social distancing, et cetera. But we're also able to express the times they feel uncomfortable. And certainly the teachers and staff in those facilities uh, do understand all of the rules too. Um, and if we get any complaint about those uh, educational facilities, it's that our guidance is too voluminous uh, because we've been so uh, meticulous about making sure safety goes first. Um, so it's a very different situation than other kinds that you've raised. Uh, I'll see if the governor has anything she wants to add, but that, that'll be the end of my comments. And the inconsistency between the state employees and everybody else. Yeah, it's not, it's not a, like that. Mike, there's not an inconsistency. We've asked all businesses if you can work remotely, any employee, employer uh, who can uh, make sure their employees work remotely should do so. And that's what we've asked of state employees as well. And uh, it's not just about, you know, it's about trying to weigh inconvenience with need. Um, so if you don't need to, don't do it. It might be more convenient to meet in person in some respects, but don't do it until we get through this. And we're just asking everyone to use some common sense and step up and do the right thing. Uh, and there is no, uh, you, you know, to be specific and, and to be consistent throughout. We want to keep the economy going as much as we can. We've proved that we can do this. But we had the economy open up uh, throughout the summer into the fall and, uh, and with very little, little uh, prevalence of, uh, of the virus. Um, so um, we were able to continue with that, and we think it's really important, as I think Anya Lita and Sabina had, uh, had told us uh, this morning, it's really important for them to be in school. We've had pediatricians tell us it's really important for kids to be in school for in-person instruction. So that's our highest priority, and it's much more of a priority uh, to have them in school than it is for us to have state employees uh, in, in meetings in person when they can do it remotely. So we've made choices uh, based on common sense, the data, the science, and so forth, and we think it's a, a good approach. Uh, and, uh, and we wanna see this through, and we'll continue to try and keep the economy going as best we can while making sure the kids uh, can stay in school. The, but these are tough choices. Thank you, I hope the readers understand that. I appreciate what you're doing. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks. Pat, WCAX. Pat, WCAX. Hi, this question, yes. Hi, I'm here. This question is for Dr. Levine. It's about the Pfizer vaccine. 
At the last press conference, you said we could potentially have 20,000 doses in Vermont by the end of the year. Is our infrastructure all set up to get those given the extremely cold temperatures that that vaccine requires? And also I had an older caller ask just a few minutes ago if you could elaborate on who will get those first shots. Great two questions. So I believe the temperature needs to be 70 degrees below zero centigrade. Uh, so really cold. Um, and we do have uh, freezer capacity uh, in much of the state for that. Fortunately, uh, there is a time period where you can take it out of that storage when it's being transported elsewhere and use more modest means like dry ice and um, not be as concerned about the temperature because you're delivering it to be administered, if you will. Uh, so we're, we have already uh, ramped up the infrastructure with regard to the freezers and uh, the transporting capacity. So that part I don't envision being a problem because we've seen that coming for a number of weeks that that will probably be the first one unless Moderna's vaccine comes alongside it. Uh, the second question um, regards this sort of prioritization scheme. So I can tell you how that stands today, but it is subject to perhaps change only because we do want to wait to get the input of ASIP, the Advisory Council on Immunization Practices, to the CDC. Our plan is past muster with the CDC. It's along the lines of what they are advising now, but I'm just saying it could be subject to change when ASIP provides its recommendations to the CDC. Plus, we have our own in-state implementation advisory committee, which is also looking at the same questions. But priority group 1A are high-risk healthcare workers. Priority group 1B are the more high-risk, high vulnerable members of our Vermont population who generally will be exceeding age 65 and will be having uh, some element of chronic comorbid diseases. Um, that's how it's laid out at this point in time. Um, there will not be enough doses for every single person in that if we got 20, but the number 20,000 is really a very fluid number right now, so don't uh, say that that's been uh, engraved in stone by any means. And I noticed we have some good news about the AstraZeneca vaccine as well this week. It seems to be performing well, especially in older adults. Given that that was being tested here in Vermont, do you have any reaction to that early data? Uh, my reaction is just similar to yours. Um, early good news, but not enough information to go on. But I'm glad you raised one other point that I can make publicly is a lot of what we do when we assess these vaccines, obviously, are they effective, are they safe? But more importantly, as you alluded to, who are they effective in and who are they safe in? And do they perform well on the average person in a volunteer trial who might be 35 or 40 years old and healthy versus did they have a group of people who were iller, who were older, or who were very young? And was the sex breakdown appropriate uh, with men and women? so that we really can make conclusions on a population-wide basis about the vaccines that we might be getting. Thank you. Um, I, just, I just want to clarify one thing, just to be sure, and maybe uh, Commissioner Sherling uh, can answer part of that, but uh, it's my understanding, we, I think we have some freezer capacity here for those sub, you know, minus 70 degrees Celsius uh, storage. Um, but we, I think, I believe we have a, a freezer that we've ordered uh, for that, and, uh, and I'm not sure about the date of delivery and dry ice as well. But we have, we certainly have some in spotty locations throughout Vermont, but we have a central location that I believe we're waiting for that freezer right now. Is that correct, Commissioner Shirley? That is correct, Governor. I believe that freezer has arrived, and we also have at least one and possibly two freezers coming from uh, the university, so uh, that capacity is uh, in motion. Great, okay, just wanted to confirm that. And, and also with all these different types of vaccines that are becoming available, I think Moderna is, uh, uh, Dr. Levine, uh, is maybe minus 20 degrees Celsius, which may be four degrees, uh, minus four degrees Fahrenheit. So we, we would have uh, storage capacity right now for that. So all of this is good news, but it's changing you know, every week. And if, as, when they bring another one online, 
uh, they, they could be even at, uh, at uh, room temperature, uh, from what I understand. So uh, it's a lot to keep track of, but I'm very thankful for Commissioner Sherling uh, keeping track of this in public safety uh, for uh, an emergency operations center for keeping uh, us going and making sure that we're ahead of this. Okay, we'll go to Jolie, Local 22. Hi, can you hear me okay? We can. Great. Uh, my questions are for uh, Secretary French. Um, Secretary French, do you know roughly what percentage of schools are fully remote, hybrid, or fully in person? As of now. Yeah, I don't know as of now, but the data I was sort of generally reviewing uh, earlier, um, you know, basically shows there's a, most of our schools still are in some sort of hybrid. It's hard to pick that apart. You know, as I was using the example of CT centers, um, you know, we think of their learning in particular being largely hands-on, and they do uh, are largely focused on in-person. But a better part of what they do is to deliver the academics online, so they designate themselves as being in hybrid mode. Um, but I think it's fair to say, particularly at the high school, middle school level, about 70% of our uh, schools at that level are in hybrid and remain in that status. Uh, what we've seen at the end, as of the end of October is uh, uh, basically a doubling of the amount of in-person at the elementary level to about, um, I think, 60% of our elementary schools at the end of October were uh, in-person. Thank you. And then um, I just wanted to ask about surveillance testing. Um, you what does that look like in schools? How often are teachers and staff members tested? Yeah, so what we've done this week is we've offered it uh, to all school staff, so it's inclusive of teachers, but also all school employees, bus drivers, uh, food service workers, and so forth. Um, and this, this week we offered it for once uh, for each district. Uh, once again, pretty, pretty phenomenal logistics involved, involving the National Guard, uh, Department of Public Safety, um, Agency of Human Services, Department of Health, uh, taking the lead on that. Um, what we're planning uh, for the next phase of this through the month of December is a slightly different program. So we'll have two days a week, uh, but we believe right now, I think Wednesday and Thursdays, um, or perhaps Tuesdays and Wednesdays, two days at any rate, where we'll be testing 25% of our schools each week for the month of December. Um, and each week, uh, unlike what we did this week, where we kind of focused on a region at a time, during December we'll uh, sort of mix up the group, so we have a representative sample, geographically speaking, uh, for each week. Um, so that's the plan right now. It's as far as we've planned out through the month of December, but it's certainly something we're hoping to continue. Great. And it is possible to get um, the grade level and school that Angelica and Sabina go to? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Just, just reach out to the agency and we can provide that information. Great, thank you so much. You're welcome. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. I had a couple of questions for Michael Herring. Uh, one grade. It's only one tenth uh, above what it was in March pre-pandemic, and I'm wondering he had provided what he what he guessed at what was the real what he felt like was the real unemployment rate given the methodology issues you have, and also maybe he can explain. Again, why the weekly unemployment data has been going up, the claims have been going up even before the seasonal variations that, that the governor had mentioned earlier. Commissioner Harrington? Uh, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, a lot of that is some speculation as well. Um, but sure. to, to get to the first question, which is, you know, certainly we have concerns about the methodology. Um, it, it's not that the data is incorrect, um, it, you know, based on what is collected, our unemployment rate has gone down um, and, and is only slightly above where we started uh, at the start of 2020. However, when we look at the number of people filing claims, um, that number is probably more likely uh, around 5%, um, but that's not, you know, un unfortunately or traditionally, we, we don't typically count um, self-employed, independent contractors, sole proprietors um, when we're calculating uh, the insured uh, unemployment rate. So if we also add in the folks that are currently filing in the pandemic unemployment assistance program, uh, I think that rate could, could go up to, you know, 
probably somewhere between six and eight percent, depending. Um, so, you know, again, a lot of that is, is just back of the napkin speculation based on claims. Um, there's a lot of components and variations and, and variables in there. Um, when you talk about um, the, the second part of it, and, and maybe you could just rephrase the second part so I fully understand what you're well, that's uh, the unemployment plan has been going up for about five weeks, uh, which is seems out of towards um, uh, with the, the seasonality of it. They're going up sort of higher than you would expect just based on that. Uh, well, I think, uh, I, yeah, I can, we can certainly see if we can drill down into that data a little bit more. But, uh, you know, we typically begin to see that type of increase um, beginning October into November. Um, so the fact that it goes back into portions of October um, is not necessarily surprising um, as we look at everything from uh, construction to the granite shed industry and others. Uh, we have, as we look at filing uh, week over week, um, we're not seeing anything that is outside of the ordinary in terms of the time of year. Uh, so from that perspective, we are seeing this more industry specific and, and seasonal, um, but I can certainly uh, drill down into that information and see if we have additional additional detail. And how many people up to UA right now? Do you know that? Yeah, it's roughly uh, just uh, shy of 9,000, I believe it's, uh, I'll have the most recent number um, later today, but I think our last count was about 8,600-ish. Uh, okay, all right, great, thank you. Yes, sir. Ann Wallace Allen, VT Diggers. Hi, thanks. Um, the state is in the process of reallocating some of the federal CRS money um, and the funds grant for agencies that need it. Um, that's the money that's coming back from the agencies that weren't able to spend it for various reasons. And I'm wondering if you know how much more of the money is going to be reallocated to business grants um, over the next few weeks while you can still do that. And if so, what kind of businesses are going to be prioritized? Yeah, we don't have um, we don't have any uh, any figures at this point uh, in terms of what is going to be left and where we're going to put it. Uh, this uh, latest request the Joint Fiscal Committee uh, is to make sure that we can do our contact tracing and, and, uh, and testing, uh, which we need to ramp up. And that I think is a, um, because of the numbers that we're seeing right now. So with our uh, increased capacity for uh, contact tracing, as well as, uh, as our testing, we uh, thought we should uh, utilize some of the money that we see. But I, I don't you know, I don't have a sense as to if uh, and how much money will be left and where we'll put it. I think we'll just uh, have to determine that uh, as we move forward and see where the need, the greatest need is. Okay, um, thanks. And also, um, with the UVM outbreak, has they assisted with any contact tracing to determine how it happened or if it's led to other cases within the nearby community, like the Burlington community at large? Dr. Levine. When you use the word UVM outbreak, what, what exactly are you referring to? Um, UVM had 35 positive cases last week, which is the highest spike they've seen in a single week you know, throughout the semester. Yeah, so you're, you're accumulating cases over several weeks. So you're correct. So, you know, those cases span, uh, they've, been, they've been keeping in close touch with us. Uh, uh, we haven't used the word outbreak necessarily. There are off-campus students who have tested positive. There are on-campus students that have tested positive. There are uh, members of the uh, staff that have tested positive. Um, these are, we think, not reflective of a campus-wide problem where there is an outbreak on the campus in a certain facility or what have you but more just a reflection again of increasing cases in Chittenden County more than anything. The UVM uh, Health Center staff work very closely with us and with our contact tracing and 
they're usually a, a step ahead. Uh, when they get their data, they're uh, embarking very quickly on that pathway. Uh, so there's a lot of close uh, working relationships there. So if you guys aren't really seeing it as an upgrade, does that mean that you're not going to um, coordinate with them any anything like contact tracing, which I don't actually know if they're doing either? No, we're, 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 I just said, we're both coordinating contact tracing on that. Uh, they, they, always, they always take the lead right away because they are their first eyes on the data. Um, they're very quick. So, you know, what, one thing they have done, uh, which they began even before the most recent cases, was allowing students, if they show, so chose, to uh, leave campus early and not wait till uh, right before Thanksgiving. Um, I don't know how much uptake they've had in that, but I know that uh, that was something they offered their campus. They continue to also make sure that students are tested within 48 hours of their departure. Um, okay, speaking of Thanksgiving, um, for students in general around the state, do you have any concern that a lot of these students are gonna be heading home for Thanksgiving? I, I realize that a lot of them are going to be traveling within Vermont, but even for the students who are going home to households in Vermont, are they going to be considered to be from different households and are they going to be asked to quarantine? Yes, that's part of our specific guidance that we've been giving uh, for a week or two now. Um, and we've been trying to telegraph that far and wide, making sure that students who are returning to a household that they haven't seen in months and months are quarantining when they arrive. Sorry, I shouldn't have asked. Right, <laughs> sorry, so sorry for the news. Thank you. Lisa, the Valley Reporter. Good afternoon. With cases increasing so rapidly in Washington County, many of our leaders have used the state town by town map. It's on the Department of Health website. It was updated on, on November 11th and then not again until November. 18. Is there a plan to update it more often? Thanks for the question, Lisa. We're looking at that right now on how we're going to update it and get information to you that uh, is timely and at the same time is, um, is done in a way that it gives the information in a more I would say productive way. So we're doing that right now. Thank you. And my follow-up question is probably also for Secretary Smith. This is, has to do with long-term care. I'm sorry, it has to do with COVID patients who are being hospitalized and then sent home rather than to rehab facilities to get strong enough to return home safely. Are rehab facilities taking COVID positive patients on their discharge from hospitals? Is there a state protocol for such patients? There are state protocols for such patients in terms of coming back to a long-term care facility. There are protocols um, uh, at the uh, hospital as well. One, one thing that you have hit upon that I'm just going to launch into, it's not directly related to your question. We do have a backlog of, of patients trying to leave the hospitals to go back to long-term care facilities. As you may know, we had a appropriation from the reallocation of the coronavirus relief fund to open up beds at Burlington Health and Rehab. This was a, a, a pretty significant problem at UVM. We got approval for that. We're working f uh, forward with Burlington Health and Rehab to bring those patients out of the hospital setting back to a long-term care facility, the Burlington Health and Rehab. There, will, there are quarantine um, provisions uh, as you come back into a, a facility. Thank you for that. This is more a case, as I understand it from a reader, this is a case where somebody who had not been in a long-term care facility was hospitalized for COVID and was not strong enough to go home, but was sent home anyway, and then ended up back in the hospital via ambulance because there was no way to get this person into a long-term care facility or rehab facility. Yeah, I think, I think this, what we've done or what we're doing is going to help that situation uh, more. There is, um, like I said, you know, bringing 
long-term care facilities, particularly now, are very careful in terms of who they're bringing in. But I, I believe the ability to open up uh, long-term care, we have available beds. I've seen the available bed list. So I can't comment specifically on this, this particular case and why this particular person wasn't accepted, but it, I will, I will do this. If you contact my office, we'll try to make sure that Dale takes a look at this particular case. Thank you very much. Why I'm up here, can I um, also, because I've seen some uh, conversations during this press conference uh, through uh, various social media outlets on testing. And it's a complicated sort of procedure. We're ramping up statewide testing through the state of Vermont, and we have a state lab here in the state of Vermont that does a quick turnaround of, 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 of uh, various lab results. And we prioritize those lab results for some of the outbreaks that are happening either in long-term care facilities or other facilities that are around the state. The provider network also uses labs and you may go to a provider and they may use a lab some of those labs in the other what happens in some of those labs is they send those labs out they send the specimens out of state to out of state labs there has been a backlog uh, in those out of state labs we met with the provider network, the hospitals uh, in particular, I met personally with at UVM yesterday and asked them to switch labs that weren't, switch their labs that weren't backlogged to other labs that had capacity and could turn around labs faster uh, than they are now. Again, our state lab has a remarkable record of turning around labs. They are prioritized though in different, um, with different facilities. The labs that we use for the pop-ups and now the on-demand uh, testing, excuse me, the labs that we use for the on-demand testing is the Broad Lab that has a very good track record. But we recognize that some providers are using labs that have a backlog and we're asking those providers to switch the labs uh, the out-of-state labs that they use to other labs that don't have a backlog. A backlog. I just wanted to clarify that. Okay. Uh, next up, we have by page. Uh, it's twelve fifty-five, and there are eleven reporters left in the page. Go ahead, Guy. Governor, if the Vermont Fuel Dealers Association reports that the City of Burlington and other municipal energy committees are considering an outright ban on new home heating systems powered by fossil fuels. It also said the State Climate Council, which met for the first time today, may also consider either a ban or financially prohibitive permit fees. Um, what do you think about banning new oil, natural gas, and propane home heat? And also, do you have any update on uh, challenging the Global Warming Solutions Act in court? Yeah, I don't have any updates for you on uh, the constitutional challenge to the Global Warming Solutions Act, but uh, stay tuned. Uh, in terms of uh, banning certain uh, energy sources, it's something that uh, some of these entities will be, be talking about and, and will obviously listen. Um, but uh, but I don't have uh, I don't have uh, a control over the, the panel the 23 member panel of the Global Warming Solutions Act. So what they do is uh, they're their own entity and they can discuss what they want. But do you have a do you have a, a position on either for or again? Uh, uh, yeah, without yeah without yeah without the data and and just uh, listening to hear what the. Uh, uh, why we would we would do this? I mean, I know why, uh, but uh, is it practical? Is it is this something we can afford? Uh, what what are the repercussions? I mean, there's so many questions uh, that come along with that. I, I couldn't stand here and say yes or no without uh, knowing all the details, and that's something that we'll we'll learn as they uh, go through some of the debate and, and some of uh, 
um, I guess, uh, deliberations. All right, we're going to go to Ham Thank Davis at the Vermont Journal. Can we? We can. Can you hear me? We can. Uh, so coming up, uh, this is two questions for Dr. Levine. So coming up in here, what I sort of think is vaccine land, and there are some very interesting questions about it that I've just not seen answered anyway. I hope you can help here. For example, the two lead, the two lead, uh, publicly leading anyway, vaccines uh, are said to be over 90%, 90% are more effective. Does that mean, I'm curious whether that means that this 10% that would get the vaccine and they would not be protected from the, from the virus. And I'm curious whether that's right. And the first question is, if you took, if you got back, if you got vaccinated with one of the, you know, one of the approved vaccines, um, could you test with a serum test whether you had the vaccine, whether you were, whether you were in effect immune or would you just have to live with the risk? That's my first question. So um, you are correct that somewhere in the 5 to 10 percent range of people in the trial uh, actually were able to get COVID uh, even though they had gotten the vaccine. But that means 90 to 95 percent were protected during the time period that elapsed of the trial. Um, your other question, could you repeat the other question? The question, the, the, my question really is, okay, if you- Oh, well, the antibody. The person, would a serum test tell you, tell the person, a given person, any person, whether he was in fact uh, protected from the virus? Yeah, so um, I'll answer it a different way because that's what's done in the first two phases of studies is they determine that your body can mount an immune response based on having received the vaccine. And they do that by looking at antibody levels. So the answer would be, you would be able to know if getting the vaccine helped you mount an immune response that then might be useful if you ever came in contact with the virus. Okay, but it would, be, it would not be dispositive. In other words, it would not guarantee you that you just wouldn't get the virus. Otherwise, the, the number of the 10% wouldn't have any meaning, right? Right, it, would, it wouldn't be a guarantee, correct. I've got a second question. And the, according to the virology community, the, uh, um, there are three different attack routes um, to, for a vaccine to come, into the, to come in and disable, if you will, the uh, COVID virus. Um, and, and, the, and, and all three uh, attack routes are being utilized by different, uh, different vaccines. If some person got a vaccine, uh, if you get vaccinated with one of these vaccines uh, and it did not help you, you were in the, in, in the, in the small percentage that, that, that was not, were not protected, then would it make sense, you could figure that out, would it make sense to try one of the other vaccines? Yeah, so, you know, I don't want to get too complex here at this hour in the press conference, but there are vaccines that respond, that provide a protein that your body then reacts and produces antibodies against, and there are vaccines that actually provide the nucleic acid or have the nucleic acid enter one of your cells and you produce antibodies against that. Um, so I guess hypothetically you could see if one vaccine was not effective, if, if another that was based on a different technology uh, could be effective. Um, right now, it's a little unclear how that's going to play out and how much meaning that would have. Right now, what we need to find out is, of all the vaccine candidates that are being tested, are some of the ones that are being successful characterized by being based on a certain protein or nucleic acid profile versus the others. Um, so it's going to be challenging to answer your question this early in the game. <clears throat> I do. Uh, that, 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 I know that. I just, I just think that question is hanging out there on the horizon. It, it, it is, and it'll be one that we might like to answer. 
I guess as an aside, I'd also like to hope that you've been hearing my guidance regarding Thanksgiving, because I know we've talked about that at prior press conferences. I, I'm totally isolated, thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, we still have nine in the queue, and it's after one. We'll go to Greg at the County Courier. Hi, Governor. Uh, following up on the Loomis, which I believe was a follow-up on my question on Tuesday, which I was told we'd get a response from, so I've heard. Uh, looking for town-by-town -town data on, a, on more than a daily basis. Uh, a, a few minutes ago, somebody said that uh, you're looking to do it in a different format, and that's why it's taking longer. But why can't we just get it in the existing format until that's figured out? Yeah, I, I don't have the answer, uh, Greg. So we'll just work our way through it. I, I don't think the answer is going to change from the, the answer we gave Lisa at this point. We'll, we'll look into it and see what we can do. Okay, it, it's certainly data that people are looking for. Um, moving on, I had a local health officer reach out uh, said they contacted the health department about a person in their town that had recently tested positive, uh, but had been seen, seen multiple times in the community, not quarantining. Uh, the caller, the, the health officer, said she did not get a response back from the health department when she posed that question. Um, I guess I'm wondering, I've looked through your governor's order, uh, and obviously it's been updated several times, but I'm not seeing anything uh, with any specifics on if you if you test positive, you have to quarantine. And I, I'm also not seeing anything where uh, if you don't quarantine, there's some sort of penalty or enforcement. So that would be part one of my question. Is that in there? Am I missing it? Yeah, I can tell you on the penalty portion, there isn't. Uh, we have not uh, put a penalty. We haven't um, issued any a fine structure. Uh, if you're not adhering to the guidelines and and some of the restrictions, uh, we've talked about that a lot uh, during the press conferences. I just don't think that that's uh, um, an effort that that is uh, you know would provide any fruit, so to speak. Uh, so, we'll um, it's still in you know it's still a possibility. Uh, we still have it in the toolbox, uh, but it's not something that we've uh, we've utilized thus far. Uh, Dr. Levine. And obviously, as a public health department, we do have uh, opportunities to make sure that we protect the health of everyone around. And if a person was thought to provide a danger to the public's health, we have authority to uh, intervene in that way. I'm not familiar with the case you're talking about, so I won't comment further on that. So what sort of enforcement measures does the state or, or a business or a health officer even have? Uh, if somebody in their town refuses to quarantine and they tested positive. Yeah, they, they individually, uh, the, the entities you just mentioned, probably don't have any specific authority, but the health department does. So I'll just leave it at that. Well, that's great, but I, uh, I got the one, I'll take that. All right, we're going to move to Avery at WCAX. Dr. Levine, the World Health Organization panel, a panel for the World Health Organization, just recommended um, that remdesivir not be used to treat hospitalized patients. I was just wondering whether you've seen that um, and what is the current state of the, the drug in Vermont? Yeah, so, you know, this is a great example, and I'll provide one other of uh, how fast things move and, and uh, where do they come from kind of thing. So there's been a lot of literature on remdesivir that was establishing it as one of the few things we could do for people in the hospital. Um, the, good, the bad news about it was it never really showed a survival advantage. The better news was that it seemed to lessen the severity or duration of the illness. Those kinds of outcomes, you know, um, the, 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 the lessening the severity or the duration might be important to an individual patient. Uh, it's not as uh, momentous as actually keeping more people alive. I, I don't have the text in front of me of what the World Health Organization said to know uh, exactly 
uh, why they came out with their pronouncement, if it was that kind of distinction or not. Um, it's the only antiviral drug right now that was in, a, in active use because none of the other trials of antiviral drugs were successful. <clears throat> I've also talked up here recently about monoclonal antibody therapy, which the federal government is trying to ship to states. It requires an infusion center and a several hour infusion, and it's supposed to reduce the likelihood of getting hospitalized if you're in a severe risk group and have a moderate illness at the time. In the last 24 hours, literally, the Infectious Disease Society of America and uh, the NIH have both come out with pronouncements uh, that I would, I would grade as less than enthusiastic about that drug, uh, that cocktail, if you will, of antibodies. Um, even though uh, just prior to that, uh, people were utilizing what literature there was available, and the federal government was feeling that this was going to be a benefit to ship to the states. So that's how quick things change in a pandemic, uh, where we don't have the luxury of waiting around months and months and months or years for studies to come out uh, and to be confirmed by subsequent studies, etc. It's just the environment we're in, unfortunately. I haven't talked to my colleagues in the uh, ICUs of our hospitals uh, in the last day or so to find out uh, if it's impacted their practice with remdesivir or not. Uh, but I'll be sure to be getting that input from them. Thank you. Lola, PT Digger. Lola? Hi there, can oh. you hear me? Yeah. Yes. You guys, oh great. Um, thanks for taking my question. Um, I've got two of them. The first one is that, you know, as part of the school reopening plan, uh, New York City set a standard that schools would close. When the seven day average positivity rate uh, hit 3%, that actually happened. Um, I understand that Vermont has taken a stance that schools should be one of the very last things to close, and that's something that public health experts um, have supported, particularly given how little transmission is occurring within schools. Um, however, are state officials working on a metric um, at which community transmission would be considered too high to keep schools open? Um, there's obviously tremendous, there is tremendous interest in it, um, in knowing what the threshold would be uh, given surging case counts. Um, and if you guys are working on such metrics, you know, what would it look like? Would it be based on community transmission or perhaps the surveillance testing that you started doing? Dr. Levine. <clears throat> yeah, these are great questions. Um, I will say from the outset that the level of 3% set by New York City was uh, was or continues to be criticized widely, um, not just by their governor, but by others as well. But you need to still put it in context with everything else that's going on around. And I'm hoping that's what the mayor and the school officials in New York did. Um, it was not maybe an isolated metric uh, in, a, in a decision based on one number, but a constellation, hopefully, of findings. Um, as you see every Tuesday here, we show our guardrails around different metrics, and one of them is um, the percent positivity rate, but again, it is only one amongst literally six, at minimum, six metrics that we're following at any one time. So I don't think we would arbitrarily say, based on one metric alone, that we needed to do something. But I will remind you that um, we've done something very significant in the last week in Vermont to protect our schools. And the percent positivity at that time was in the low 1% range. Uh, but there are other indicators in alliance with that that made us say, we need to do something. Uh, so hopefully what we've done will protect that metric from ever getting higher than 3%. Uh, not that that's the level that we are arbitrarily going to set. So to be clear, are you working on a set of metrics that would dictate when and if schools would close. I'm not saying it has to be New York City, I'm just no. wondering if 
what I'm saying is, You're not working. yeah, it's, what I'm saying is it's the same set of metrics we're using in general uh, every week on Tuesdays that we present to you to assess not just schools but other sectors of society that either should be open, closed, or what have you. Uh, so uh, it's it's really not isolating the schools out in any way. Uh, obviously. As I said earlier, there's a community in Washington County that felt that its rate is much too high and there was an impact on staff because staff uh, had virus and it made sense for them to close the schools even without anybody directing them to because it was a pragmatic solution to a problem and it was their attempt to keep everyone else as safe as possible. So we respect that. But this would be one of many metrics and it wouldn't just be directed at schools. I'd also say that uh, our, our key goal here uh, is to protect all students at all levels, but there are places around the country that realize that high school students, in terms of the virus, are more like adults, um, and some, at some points actually close the higher level grades at the attempt to make sure that the lower level grades can stay open uh, because of the way virus is not transmitted well among students to each other or to their uh, adults who are in the building. So a lot of things go into these decisions, um, but we would never just pivot off of the positivity rate for the schools. And it would be schools amongst all other sectors of society. I, I understand that it does not necessarily need to be one metric, but I'm just wondering if you know there is a plan in place to set some sort of Standard, and this could be a variable standard depending on the region or the type of school. Yeah. But um, Lola, I think I'm, I'm not aware. I think Dr. Levine had, had answered. Uh, maybe you didn't hear that part, but uh, he, they are not working on that at this point in time. Um, I think it's open ended uh, in terms of uh, the districts uh, con consulting uh, with the health department, and we've been doing that right along. If they want assistance, they want some. Uh, reaction or advice, um, we're there to give it. Uh, but, uh, but at this point in time, we're not working on a metrics to automatically shut down the school. Okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. And then uh, just one other oh, question. Um, I've, I've heard varying um, interpretations from schools of, of how, of basically how to deal with uh, when either, you know, students, staff, particular students, um, are you know socializing um, against the governor's order and what to do given the fact that the order itself didn't include enforcement act mechanisms you know right now schools are allowed to say exclude a student from school if they spike a fever or haven't been following the travel guidance um, but you know after some superintendents say yes i can send a kid home if I know they went to a party, and some superintendents say, I have been told I cannot do that. So I'm just wondering if, um, what Second, schools are allowed to do. Uh, Secretary French. Yeah, thanks, Lola. It is something we're working on. Uh, as you alluded to, um, schools are required to implement daily health check, um, which asks uh, students and staff on a daily basis to um, basically provide an attestation that they don't have symptoms or they haven't traveled. Um, and that daily health check does not include anything about uh, multi-household gatherings. So um, we are taking a looking at, look at that right now, but schools aren't necessarily in a, in a good position to essentially enforce that. Um, their primary function right now is to just keep promoting uh, the education piece of that. Um, but certainly a daily health check uh, does, does uh, force a certain amount of compliance um, on individuals, including staff and students. But it is, we're aware of the uh, issue, it's something we're working on. All right, thank you. All right, folks, it is 1.16. We have six left in the queue. Um, I'm gonna have to just ask for everybody to ask one question, the remaining folks, and I apologize that not everybody limited their questions throughout the process, uh, but we've got to get this team out of here. Austin, Burlington Free Press, one question, please. Hi, yeah, thanks for sticking it out with us here. Um, uh, my question, I'll get right to it. Uh, why weren't the clarifications outlined earlier 
already in place with last week's announcement, and when did you decide to uh, make those amendments? Yeah, yeah, good question. Uh, you know, we we had to impose uh, restrictions in a in a quick fashion uh, based on the uh, expedited uh, you know virus uh, count. This came to us quick, uh, as you might recall, uh, three weeks ago. Uh, we didn't uh, we didn't have this number of cases. We were in the in the twenties, I believe, uh, on an average, and then all of a sudden they started to spike. Um, so we decided to take quick action. Uh, so we imposed the restriction based on the data and the science and the contact tracing, uh, and which led us to believe it was all about social gathering. So we had to impose something quick. That was what we did uh, and took decisive action. Uh, based on some of the reaction, uh, some of the questions, uh, nothing's ever perfect. Uh, so we wanted to reflect on that, and we've been working throughout the week uh, to, uh, to determine what can we do to alleviate some of the concerns and use some common sense and imposing these restrictions while everyone keeping everyone safe. So that's basically what happened. I mean, it was just a, a time factor. Uh, it wasn't as though we had a month to think about this. Uh, we had to, to react quickly uh, based on what we were seeing. And a lot of it was about, the again, those social gatherings, whether it was uh, the Halloween parties or, or at the uh, social clubs or at bars or whatever it was. Um, we had barbecues, but it was all based on 71% of that were based on social uh, neighborhood safe social gatherings of some sort and uh, some of those other uh, social events so we uh, we just took decisive action very quickly uh, but uh, but again we wanted to use some common sense and alleviate it uh, as best we could okay. Steve NEKTV one question please um, hello can you go ahead Steve can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, speaking of uh, data and science, um, it, in today's uh, today's free press, there was a an AAP study survey that showed for uh, for every two COVID deaths in nursing homes, there was uh, uh, one from either uh, neglect, uh, uh, lack of physical contact, failure to thrive, uh, stealth starvation from depression, etc. Uh, and it seems to be the a lack of contact and physical contact um, with friends and relatives uh, might be might be harming um, a, a lot of our elders. <clears throat> and secondly, um, uh, I'm sure as you know, there was uh, a couple days ago there was an actual randomized trial um, uh, with the Danish mask study uh, that, that showed case growth. Uh, even with high compliance, the study was months in the making and basically concluded that there were no difference in cases or in level of transmission in the community uh, for mass. And uh, that appears to correlate um, with, the, with the charts and graphs that I've seen regarding mass wearing uh, and spikes after the mass wearing in um, all different states and countries around the globe. Uh, is, is there yeah. any, uh, I'll let Dr. Levine that? answer that, but I would ask you, Steve, to take a look at the states that don't have, uh, have not had mask mandates and their rate of positivity versus states that do have mask mandates. They're almost identical. No, I, I, I would disagree, uh, Steve. I mean, if you take a look at South Dakota and North Dakota versus Vermont I'm not, and Wyoming, I'm not sure you'd see the same thing. So I'd, I challenge you on that. Well, I, I, I sent along the, the graphs to uh, to the to your assistants last uh, last press conference. Steve, I'm up here to answer your question. Uh, I can't answer the first one regarding the free press, but I'll be delighted to uh, have you send me the study that it's referring to, and I can comment on it at a later time. With regard to the mask study, though, I feel very qualified to discuss that, and I want to again, for viewers, point out. And listeners, point out the uh, opportunities to misapply science during the pandemic. They're abundant. And for people to cherry pick studies and say that that overturns every piece of prior literature is unfair. Uh, but it happens constantly during the pandemic. So this study did not show that the group that wore masks versus the group that didn't wear masks um, improved an outcome. And the outcome was 
whether they contracted the virus or not. However, that does not mean that this proves that we should not wear masks. I will quote from the lead author of the study. Even a small degree of protection is worth using the masks because you are protecting yourself against a potentially life-threatening disease. That's the person who authored the study. Um, the journal, I believe, was the Annals of Internal Medicine. Uh, I'm actually a uh, friends with the editor-in-chief. Her comment was that she felt it was an important study to publish, not necessarily because of the result it found, because there were lots of issues regarding the methodology of the study, but because there were so few randomized studies looking at people wearing masks versus not wearing masks, and she felt that this should be put under the microscope of scientific scrutiny, if you will. Um, but she clearly states it did not answer the question about whether widespread masking mitigates SARS-CoV-2 infection, but it was the only randomized trial, so it was an important study for her to publish. So lots of other people in public health have weighed in and really felt that we should not use this study uh, to tell people to not use masks. Again, failing to prove to prove that there was a favorable impact in those who wore the masks in one study uh, does not cut it in the scientific world and clearly does not uh, use it as evidence to not wear the mask. We are pressed for time, so I will stop there, but thanks for the question. Olivia, WCAS. Hi. Hi. I'm a question. Education. So some schools have already decided to go remote after Thanksgiving. They expect that families won't comply with the travel or social gathering guidance, and it sounds like the AOE is also looking at incorporating that into the daily health checks. Um, but we've also heard from one district that says that they want to be able to ban kids suspected of attending large family gatherings. Um, in addition, one of the students who spoke said that she's scared to go back after Thanksgiving. So why isn't the state ordering remote learning for two weeks after the holiday? Yeah, I think uh, you know that what you know. We, we, our decision making is really grounded in the data, and we don't have any real strong indication in the data that uh, schools contribute to the spread of the virus. Uh, we do have data that indicates that the cause of what we're dealing with in the last several weeks is directly related to gathering. So, therefore, you know, the, the governor's revised order and our, our interest in going after this very specific issue precisely so we can uh, keep schools open. So, if, if we had other data that indicated otherwise, our policy would be different. But right now, we don't have any indication that schools are a cause of transmission. We do also, you know, as, as was cited, uh, have strong uh, indication from pediatrician and other health experts on the importance of in-person instruction. That's why it's a priority. So I, I disagree, uh, as I had I said a couple of press conferences ago, with a, sort of a preemptive uh, decision um, not based on data at this point. And on the other hand, as we've acknowledged, school districts do have very real logistical challenges with staffing and otherwise that can affect them, and they have to be able to make those decisions. But at this moment, there isn't strong uh, health or epidemiological data that would support a, a, the, any, any rationale to preemptively close schools. And I am aware of that, but do you truly think that all families will listen to the guidance and not gather and not see their friends, and that there won't be any outbreaks if you do not go remotely? Well, we certainly hope so, uh, but I would also just echo what I said previously, that schools, uh, the mitigation strategies we do have in schools indicate that we can operate schools safely, and we're seeing that kind of data represented internationally as well. All right, we're going to move to Liz, the Burlington Free Press. Hi, my question is for Dr. Levine. I'm following up on Greg's question from the County Courier. Um, said that the health department does have enforcement power. If somebody breaks isolation, I wanted to know what that power is. Yeah, that, that requires a legal response, which I'm not prepared to give you today. Um, but 
we, we would have power to uh, make sure that a person who needed to be isolated and was a risk to those around them uh, was not able to be of risk. Okay, thank you. Tom? Uh, it says local 22, although I believe Tom is with BT Bigger. Tom Kearney? Tom? Here. Yeah, go ahead, Tom. Uh, yeah, I'm ready. Thank you. Uh, just a, a suggestion. Uh, could you guys have a section of this press conference called Important Developments? You know, where we could run down things like the Rutland Nursing Home outbreak and anything else that comes up. I know you got a lot of moving parts, but if you had a moment where you had to say, okay, here are five things that you all know about, that'd be great. But just a question, just in terminology, a week ago, a walk with a friend was banned, and now it's okay. I understand you changed, uh, but isn't that a change, not a clarification? Sure. All right, we'll go Thank to you. Andrew, Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Thanks for uh, sticking with us all. Um, probably for Dr. Levine, um, you've drawn attention to Washington and Orange counties as particularly worrisome in the last week or so. Are there other specific parts of the state that are also on your radar in that sense? Or are rising cases so pervasive at this point that the whole state is of equal concern? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, you've heard some discussion about the map this time. And one of the modifications we're considering of the map to provide more useful information that would answer your question is not just to uh, show where more cases are occurring so that a very uh, hot part of the state would show a lot of cases and then another part of the state that's much more populated might have a similar number of cases. But obviously, the rate per 10,000 people would be markedly different because of the population densities. So. Uh, we think that perhaps portraying it in that way could be useful, and that's what's undergoing active discussion right now. The um, other parts of the state uh, were always concerned uh, in Trenton County because it is more populous um, if there are more cases there. Um, so that remains this sort of the second ranking part of uh, the proportion of cases that we see on a regular basis. Uh, you know, Washington and Orange County have been in the 40% range. Chittenden County is certainly not more than half of that. And then beyond that, we've been concerned about uh, some of the uh, counties that adjoin the New Hampshire border, uh, like Essex County and to its west, uh, Orleans, just because of the fact that we don't normally see a lot of activity in that part of the state and we've seen uh, more activity than we're accustomed to, some of which we can de definitely correlate to uh, border kind of issues, uh, with people uh, using different facilities on both sides, whether it be schools or business establishments, what have you. But I, I can't say that every part of the state is created equal in this sense, so there are abundant parts of the state that have less air activity than um, what we're seeing in the places I've mentioned. All right, thank you very much. We'll see you on Tuesday.